Anyway, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. I want to talk about the journey, the Christmas journey, and we are all in a journey. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1 through to verse 7. It says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all, uh, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In this Christmas story, uh, it's talking about the journey. And, and maybe many of you are going to be journeying this Christmas season. Maybe you will be traveling. You'll be going to see some loved ones. Maybe loved ones will be coming to see you. Maybe you'll be going to see some exotic, warm places like Hawaii or something like that. But you're probably going to be on some type of journey. And in the Christmas here, there was a journey too. They actually say that here in North America, Thursday and Friday, the airline industry anyway, said that th those were their peak days days. And all the year, that's when the most number of people are going to be flying. That was last Thursday and Friday. Of course, this weekend, who knows what's happening in Toronto there with the storm. Nobody, maybe nobody's flying there. That's another question. But in the Christmas story, there was a lot of traveling that was taking place. When the annunciation of, of the birth of Christ came, and Gabriel came to, to Mary and said, you're going to be with the child, that was in in the Gospel of Matthew, it's recorded there. Then Mary right away goes to what some would think is her cousin, perhaps not, but Elizabeth, one of her relatives, and spends some time there, travels there, then travels back to, to the Judea, uh, to Galilee region. And there, because of a census, they have to go to Bethlehem. So she and Joseph travel to Bethlehem. When they get to Bethlehem, it says that the angels proclaimed to the shepherds in the field that there was a, a wondrous child that was born. And so the shepherds, journeyed from their fields to Bethlehem. Having seen the Christ child, then they journeyed back to their fields, and as they traveled along the way, they shared the good news with the people that were around them. Then two years later, the wise men, following a star, traveled from the east down to the Bethlehem region. First of all, they come to Jerusalem, talk there with King Herod, trying to find out where this new king is going to be born. They find out that he's going to be born in Bethlehem. They travel from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Then an angel warns them in a dream, says, don't go back to Jerusalem. So they journey back into another way. The angel then appears to Joseph in a dream, says to him, there is danger here. Herod's going to try to kill the child, move and travel to Egypt. So Joseph and the Christ child and Mary journey to Egypt. In Egypt, they wait there till Herod dies. Then coming back, they realize, oh, oh, Herod's brother is still ruling. He is an evil man. Maybe it's still not safe because he too might want to get rid of the heir apparent as they were thinking anyway. And so instead of coming back to the Bethlehem region or to Jerusalem region, they go up to Nazareth. There is a lot of journeying taking place. And all of us are on a journey. Our lives, by the way, are a journey. And so that's what I want to talk about is the journey. Some of us have journeys and we could say, you know, I am following the star. I'm following the leading of God. And I would be nice if all of us could say every moment of my life, I'm just following God's direction and he's leading me and I just follow the star. Wouldn't it be nice if there was that star for each of us that just kind of hung in front of us and we just have to follow it wherever it goes? That's not always the case. Rarely is that the case, by the way. Many times it's our own plans and I'm not saying that it's wrong, but sometimes that's the way it is. In Herod's case, he told the wise men, he said, come back here and tell me where this child is, and I'm going to go. I'll make my plans. I'll alter my plans, and I'll go and worship this child too. Of course, we know his plan was to kill the child, but he made his own plans. And sometimes our journey is neither following God's direction, neither our plans, but sometimes it's circumstance. 
And in the scripture that I just read, perhaps Mary and Joseph were more led by circumstance than they were by the direction of God. Now, God needed them to get to Bethlehem because Malachi 5 verse 2 says that this child would be born in Bethlehem. But I am positive that Joseph and Mary weren't thinking, you know what, there's a scripture in Malachi that says that this Christ child is going to be born in Bethlehem. I think we should go to Bethlehem to have the child there. You know what they're thinking? Mary's thinking, I'm about to have this baby. Any moment, it's it's about to come. I am not traveling with this baby. I am not getting it. Joseph says, we have to go. There is a law. Caesar Augustus said, there's a taxation, and we need to go into the census. We have to go, but I don't want to. No matter. I don't want to. The baby's coming. I don't care. She probably did not want to go. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty positive she didn't want to go. But the circumstances guided her. It's interesting, historically, that most commentators, and I, I've read through about 10 of them this, this last week, and most of them, historically, most historians and biblical critics, when they read that instance in Luke chapter 2 about how there was this census that took place when Quirinius was the governor of Syria, there is no historical, they did not find any historical record to prove that Quirinius was the governor of Syria at the time when Christ was born. Christ was born about 4 BC, and yet, yet historically, Quirinius ruled in Syria in 6 AD. And now there is understanding that there was a census somewhere around that time when he was ruling in Syria at that time. But historically, this was there's a great problem. And, and biblical critics said, I think Luke has got it wrong. Now, Luke is very accurate. Whenever he gives names and locations through the book of Luke and through the gospel of Acts, he is very accurate as to the exact precise location, who was ruling, what was taking place. But in this instance, he seems so off. And so many people just said, you know, you're wrong. Luke is off. He does not have his accuracy there. And if he's not accurate there, then maybe the whole account is wrong. And then they said, and furthermore, there is no record that the Romans required anybody to travel to their own home. Who would call them to go back to their place where they were? Their lineage was born to be, to have a census. That makes no sense. And then that would be done on a regular basis. That just wasn't happening either. Until recently, they found an inscription in in Antioch, and they found out that there was a Quirinius who was the governor of Syria in around 6 or 7 B.C. Uh Uh-huh. And then they found out that, yes, the Romans did have regular senses. And then there was a a papyrus uh, writing that was was found in Egypt. And on this papyrus writing, and this was written uh, after the death of Christ, but in this papyrus writing, it talked about how there was this royal decree coming from Rome that stated that everybody needed to go back to the hometown of their lineage so that they would be assessed and that the records would be made. Oh, maybe Luke did have it right. But we're all on a journey. And whether we're on a journey because the circumstances have forced us onto this journey, or maybe we've made plans, maybe we're making plans for this Christmas Eve and this Christmas, and I hope this Christmas Eve includes coming to the Christmas Eve service, because I'm going to be here. And, but, well, not because I'm going to be here, because Jesus is going to be here. Okay, don't come because of me. That would be wrong. That would not be good. Uh, uh, you know, but come because of Jesus. That'd be way greater. But, or maybe, maybe it's our circumstances have guided, or maybe we're following the direction of God. We were on a journey. I was talking, it was the end of November, I was talking to a, an elderly couple. They were sitting right over here in the front rows of the church. It was between services. And I said, so what are you going to be doing uh, this Christmas season? And he said, we are going to be going to Hawaii. And I said, Hawaii, that's going to be pretty exciting. What are you going to be doing there? And they said, well, first of all, we are going to be going. They're, they're, they're you know, older than me. Oh, they're about 65, maybe not that much older. <laughs> uh, they, they're retired, and they said, we're going to be volunteering on a mission base. And on this mission base, we're going to be serving. And she said, I'm going to be working in the kitchen. I'm going to be cooking meals. And he said, I'm going to be at a security gate, and we're going to be doing some repairs. In this. And it is so much fun just to serve on this mission base. And I said, well, that'll be an interesting way to, you know, go through Christmas. He said, oh, no, no, at Christmas, we're taking a break. 
on Christmas. And I thought, oh, so then you're going to sit in the sun. Then you're going to go lie in the beaches. Then you're going to see this beautiful blue water of Hawaii. And they said, oh, no. And their eyes lit up. And they said, that's when we get to share our faith. I said, you, then you get to share your faith? She said, they said, yes. They said, and they were, they were so excited. They said, when we're there, there's a tourist all over. There's people all over visiting. And we asked them three questions. And we said, these three questions, we ask every tourist. And sometimes the tourists come up to us and they ask us these questions. And I said, well, what are those three questions? They said, well, the three questions are, where did you come from? What are you doing here? Or why are you here? And where are you going? Where did you come from? Why are you here? And where are you going? And so that's what I want to ask. We're on a journey right now. We're going someplace. Where did we come from? Why are we here? And where are we going? Now, if you were to talk to, to uh, uh, Mary and Joseph, and you said, Mary and Joseph, uh, where did you come from? Well, they could have said, well, you know, it says right there in the Bible. Didn't you read it? It said, we came from Galilee from Nazareth. Oh, okay, you came from Galilee from Nazareth. And, and then they could have said, but more precisely, Mary could have said, my father was Heli. And Joseph could have said, my father was Jacob. And that's where I came from. And I could say, well, yeah, I came from, I came from Kenora, Saskatchewan, or I came from my house and I came to church, you know, or I came from Kenora, Saskatchewan. Before that, I was, I was born in Regina, and I came from my parents, Harry and Lorraine, and that would be an answer. But the question really is, where did you come from? And I'm not talking about whose parents or what community but where did you come from? Because where you come from affects your perspective of yourself. I was flying uh, a couple months ago, I was flying from Atlanta to Chicago. And on the flight, I was six, sitting next to an Afro-American lady. And early into the conversation, she said that she's a Buddhist. She's been a Buddhist for 25 years. And I was thinking, oh, she's a Buddhist. And I was thinking, okay, a Buddhist, uh, Eastern religion, they believe in reincarnation, that every birth is a consequence of a rebirth, that there's, there's a death and every de uh, there's a death takes place, and that person, because of karma, good karma, bad karma, is reincarnated into another person or another individual or another creature, lesser or higher in the scale, depending on how things go. And so in, in, in the Eastern religions, there's these cycles of life and death, and then it comes reincarnated into another life and into another death and life, another life and then another death. So uh, I said to her, I said, so, so you must believe in reincarnation then? And she said, yes, I do. And I said, well, that's interesting because I majored in math and, and sciences in university. And, and, and if there's a, a reincarnation, well, you know, then everything just starts and it's reincarnated and it's reincarnated. And so you just can keep going back. And well, I was reincarnated from this and from this and from this. And you just keep going back. And they would just say, well, it just continues on and on and on and on forever. This cycles of life and death and just continues forever. And I said, but so that would just go on forever, just like for in infinity. And they she said, she said, yes. And I said, well, mathematically, if you have an infinite progression, you can never get here unless you have a starting point someplace here. And if you don't have a starting point here, then you can build from there and say, well, here's 5,000 years or here's 25 million years or 14 billion years, whatever you want. But at least you've got a place to start. But if you don't have a starting point then you never actually get to the present. And so, if there's no starting point, you actually don't get here. And so, mathematically, I said, you know, reincarnation doesn't work for me. Now, biblically, God said that he created. There was a creation time, and from that point, everything else continues. And scientifically, you know, if you believe in the Big Bang, which all scientists are forcing themselves to, there, there is a starting point. And from that starting point, everything can continue. But it cannot continue. We, we could not be here if there isn't a starting point, because you just can't add to infinite and infinite and infinite. It gets in place. And she said, oh, she hadn't thought about that. But you see, where do we start? 
Where did we come from? I was ministering in northern Manitoba several weeks ago, and it was a, a very poor area. The people are impoverished. They don't have a good perspective of themselves. There's a lot of drugs and alcohol. There's a lot of physical abuse. And, and the people feel that often they are oppressed by the situations that racially they are discriminated against. And, and it, it is not a wholesome and positive situation. And as I was talking to them, I said, where did you come from? And they could easily say, well, I come from this community and think, you know, I come from this community. Well, I come from these parents and maybe it's not the best of situation there. I said, but where did you come from? And I said, if you believe in evolution, if you believe that somehow you are a product of some slimy ooze that came out of the water, then what value do you have? I said, you know, I've got, a, I've got a, a fountain that I kind of made in my backyard. I fill it up with tap water. I let it bubble for a couple of weeks. And in a couple of weeks, the water's turned green. There's some slimy stuff. The mosquitoes are breeding in it. You see these little things wiggling around in it. I put some bleach in it. Kills it all. I don't feel badly about that. Now, maybe I killed some descendants. I don't know, you know. <laughs> I said, you know, if you believe that you're a product of a worm, you know, I have sow bugs in my house. When I see them crawling across the floor, I, it's, I told you my house is a mess, you know. I have sow bugs in my I pick them up, I crunch them, I throw them in the garbage. It's my house cleaning job, you know. Uh, but if you believe that you are a product of evolution, then what value and worth do you have? Where do you come from? Where did you come from? Jesus could have said, well, I came from Nazareth. By the way, in John chapter 1, uh, Nathaniel comes, Philip comes to Nathaniel and says, we have found the one who was spoken of by the prophets in the Old Testament, the one who Moses talked about. We have found Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus could have said, I am from Nazareth. <laughs> By the way, that was the title that he carried himself. Often he just talked about himself as Jesus of Nazareth. But he could have made that his title, which would have been a limiting title. He could have said, well, I am the son of Mary. And everybody would have said, oh, yeah, we know how Mary got her son. Yeah, we know about that. He, you know, she said she had no sex with Joseph, but oh, yeah, had a child before she was married. Uh-huh. Could have been a mother of ill repute. But Jesus knew where he came from. And so in John chapter 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word came and dwelt among us. It says in Philippians chapter 2 that when our Lord was in heaven, equal with God. He did not consider that a prized thing that he would hold on to, but he humbled himself and he came down to earth in the form of a man, a servant for all of us, even to the point of death. He knew where he came from. Where did you come from? Did you come from the process of evolution, in which case, well, what worth and what value do you have? It says in Ephesians chapter 1 that God, before the foundation of the world, he chose you. God knew, even before your mom and dad, before the, the egg and the sperm came together, before any of that took place, before your parents were even born, God knew, before the foundation of the world, God knew that you would exist and he chose you to walk with him. He said, I want you to be a child of mine. I want you to walk with God. You are so valuable. You are so precious. You have such great worth. I want you to be a child of mine. The choice is yours. He chooses you. You have a choice to respond or not. You have great worth because God, God, the almighty God, picked you out. Picked all mankind out. Choice is whether we want to respond or not. Knowing where we came from gives us great value and great worth. We are not just some product of evolution. We are not just some cycle of life and birth and that just continues on and on and on. The almighty God chose us before the foundation of the world because he sees value and worth in each of you. Where have you come from? That's an important question. Why are you here? 
has another important question. Why are you here? Why are you here? Well, I'm here to hear this great message from Pastor Mark, but Keith is preaching instead. Yeah, you know, okay, I'm sorry. I'm disappointing you. Yeah, well, you know, too bad for you. Come Christmas Eve. Come Christmas Eve. Make up for it. I won't make up for it. Pastor Mark will. No, God will make up for it. Okay, why are you here? Why are you here? That's a good question. Why are you here? I was talking to this lady. She asked me what I did. I asked what she did. She said, I'm a motivational speaker. She said, I go and I try to encourage people. I help them to, to produce the best in themselves. And I'm thinking, oh, that sounds like a new age thing. Uh, you know, uh, and she said, she said, I'm trying to, I try to encourage people to, to obtain their, their highest potential, to reach that which is their highest initiative, so that all of the things that they want to become will be fulfilled in their lives. I said, wait a second. Everything that they desire and want to become will be fulfilled in their life. She said, yes. I said, well, that, that's, that's not what Buddhism's about. Buddhism, the source of evil, the source of corruption in, in Buddhism is our desires. It's our wants. And the thing that you try to get rid of is your desires and their wants. Because in Buddhism, they understand that all evil is your desires. It's our desires to have and our, our desires that want that cause us to fight and to, to quarrel within others. And by the way, the gospel, the book of James talks about that. Why are the Fightings and wars is because you desire to have. And then it says, and then there's a frustration because we want to have something, and when we don't get it, then there's this frustration too. And so in Buddhism, the source of all evil, the source of the problems is our desires. And he said, oh, no, wait a second. I, 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 that's the old Buddhism. I'm a new Buddhist. <laughs> a new Buddhist. And I thought, oh, yeah, she's a new age person. I understand. Yeah, okay. But why are you here? Why are you here? Jesus said, uh, it says actually, let me just go back first. Uh, it says in 1 John chapter 3 concerning Jesus, it says, for this purpose was the Son of God revealed. This is the purpose why God revealed his Son. And it says to destroy the work of the evil one. God had a purpose. Jesus had a purpose. He knew why he was here on earth. Jesus speaks in John chapter 18. He says, for this reason, for this cause, I have come to the earth to show forth truth and that the truth might be explained clearly. He says, that's the reason why I'm here, so that I'd overcome the evil one and so I'd explain to you. Jesus knew what his purpose was. What's your purpose? Why are you here? Is it just to make money? It's just to have a good time? Not a good purpose. God has a purpose for you. You know why you're here? Your purpose on earth, the purpose of every human being on earth is so that we would come into a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we would come into a walk with the almighty God and then having done that, that then we would be transformed so that we would look like Jesus Christ. So that in the world around us, people would look at us and they would say, wow, that person is different. What has that person got? I would like to be like that person. And then we'd be able to share with them how Jesus Christ loves them and wants to overcome the force of darkness as well and the consequences of sin and that they too could come into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why you're here. This lady, when she talked about her purpose, her purpose was to help people get better. And her understanding was that somehow within our own hearts and within our own minds, everybody is perfect. And if we just draw out the goodness that is within everybody, then our world would be a better place and we'll have greater harmony and unity with everybody. And the question is, how's that working? How's that working in today's society? When, our, when we are, are more technologically advanced than ever before, our communication skills around the world are greater than ever before. We have more capital wealth than ever before in the planet, the whole planet. Our standards of living across the planet are greater than ever before. How's that working? In the last hundred years, we've had more wars than ever before in history. In the last hundred years, we've killed more people in fighting and conflict than ever before in history. And how is that working that somehow we are this inside, we, we're just, we're, we're born perfect, there's no flaw in us, and we just need to draw that out. Is that working? No. And there's a flaw there in the logic. Somehow it, it makes an assumption that, that we're all just perfect and it, just, it, just, it just, just needs to be drawn out. Well, the question is, so where did we lose that perfection? We're in this cycle of 
Death and life and death and life, going back, back, back. Where did we lose that? Where did, if we were perfect to begin with, where did that get lost? Well, God actually tells us where it got lost. It was because we weren't perfect, we sinned. And then, well, we were born perfect, but we made a choice and we sinned. And therefore, we need a redeemer. And that's why Jesus came. And that's why our purpose is to touch others. So we have this challenge, okay, because we know our past, where we came from, we have great worth. Because we know why we're here, we have a job that brings reality. The next question is, where are we going? Where are we going from here? Jesus, it says, knew that where he was going. In John chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus is about to wash the disciples' feet. Very interesting verse. And it says, Jesus, knowing where he came from, that means he knew he had worth value, significance. He was a child. He was the son of God, not just a child of God, the son of God. And knowing where he was going, it said that he could, he then washed the disciples' feet. He took a towel, he girded himself, and he started to wash these smelly feet of the disciples. Why could he do that? Because he knew where he was going. In John chapter 14, he says to the disciple, verse 3, he says, he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there's many mansions, and I'm going there. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be there soon. He knew where he was going. And because he knew where he was going, he could put up with the stuff in the middle. He could go through the horrific last week of his life before the crucifixion, where he was going to be whipped, tortured, where he's going to be mocked and spit upon, where they put a crown of thorns on his head, where he would be nailed on the cross. He could go through that because he knew where he was going. And you know, God speaks to all of you. He says in 1 John chapter 5, he says that these things are written The things in the scriptures are written so that you might know that you have eternal life. And the word there, know, means that you would have a certainty. That there would not be, well, I hope I'm going to have eternal life. It sure would be nice if I went to heaven. I I hope I am. Wow, man, I I hope it works out. He says these things are written so that you can know that you have eternal life. And you see, when you know that this end is a certainty, then it doesn't matter what's happening here in the middle. Now, it doesn't mean that what's happening here in the middle isn't uncomfortable, that it's not awkward, that it's not a little bit challenging. But you know what? So, so it's not nice. So my, my house is a mess. So, so the carpet's not clean, and there's no food prepared. I know I have an eternity. And maybe I don't have a lot of money. And maybe nobody visits me at Christmas. That's fine. I'm not saying I like that. But I have an eternity. And because I have the end, I can make it through the time right now. And this Christmas season, beloved, if we realize where have we come from, we have come from the heart and the mind of God, that he has a worth and a value for us that's not dependent on where you're born or where you're living. Well, I was born in India. It's so poor there. God has a worth and value for you. Well, my family's not very important. It's really a poor and backward family. God has a worth and a value for each of you. Well, I don't have much money, and I don't have good looks or or bald head. You know, I don't... You know, don't get personal, Keith. Okay. You know, God has a worth and a value for you. Doesn't depend on where you're raised, who your parents, or what you're going through right now. God has a value for you. And because we have an eternity, and he says, you can know that for certain. Then this Christmas season, if it doesn't go nicely, I'm not saying I'm wishing this for anybody, but maybe people aren't friendly at your Christmas meal. That's fine. I don't have to get bent out of shape because I know where I'm going. And maybe my car doesn't work on the coldest day of December. That's fine. I still know where I'm going. And maybe I get no presents. That's fine. 
I still know where I'm going. And then I can have peace in the midst of this Christmas season, in the midst of every day of my life. Because I know where I've come from. That God has a value and a worth for me. And I know where I'm going. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? And then, in the midst of this Christmas season, then I can share with others how they too can know this living God who brings peace, who is there. And not like this, this lady that I talked to, she said, you know what, I, I'm just so into this, this Esther Higgs and, and Abraham and, and Esther, yeah, there's this channeling between Esther Higgs and, and Abraham and Abraham's a we and there's this channeling that takes place and they, they did all this stuff and, and she's, she's just, and I'm thinking, I have a living relationship with the living God where the Spirit of God speaks and ministers through His Word and by His presence. And we can all have that because we have Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. And this Christmas season, knowing where we've come from, where we're going, we can then share with others about how we have this great God who is with us all the time in every situation here all the way into eternity. I would like to say that at the end of this flight that this lady gave her life to the Lord, and I'm sorry I can't say that. I was able to challenge her thinking in some areas. I was able to pray uh, with her, and I was continue to pray for her, that God will somehow bring her to a, a walk with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Otherwise, I, she's hoping that she's going to come to some level of enlightenment. At the end of the conversation, she said, she said, you know, you are walking in an area of enlightenment that few people make. I just talked through what we're doing in missions and stuff like that. She said, you have this level of self-sacrifice and self-denial and this, this self-awareness that is, wow, phenomenal. I'm thinking, oh, I've got this. No, I'm actually, I'm thinking, I don't have anything. It's just Jesus and his goodness. And I would like to think that she came to know the Lord, but I don't think so yet. But I'm trusting that God will minister to her. But we have opportunities all around us to share about this great God. Plant seeds that hopefully will come and bring life into the hearts of many. Because we know where we've come from. We know why we're here. And we're strong because we know where we're going. Will you stand, please? I don't know where you are in your walk with God, but I know that God would want you to know for certain that if you were to die tonight, that you would go to heaven. And it wouldn't be a question, well, I hope so, well, I, yeah, I go to church and maybe, but you would know for certain because these things are written so that you might know with a certainty that you have eternal life. And I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to call anybody forward. But I want to give you an opportunity to know for certain that you have eternal life. And I said I'm not going to embarrass you. So I ask if you all would just bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you would like to know for certain that, yes, if you were to die tonight, that you'd go to heaven, then I just want you to raise your hand and signal to God and say, yeah, God, that's me. I want to know for certain. Is there anybody here that says, yes. That's me. I want to know for certain. Just signal to God. Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Simple as that. Thank you in the back, ma'am. Anyone else? I don't want you to miss this opportunity. Don't miss this Christmas season and think, wow, if only... Signal to God. Okay, thank you. You're back as well. Okay, I've seen some hands. I probably missed some. But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you in prayer. And if you put up your hand, I want you to pray with all your heart. And if you didn't put up your hand, but you should have, I want you to pray as well. And pray and mean what you're praying, okay? And a congregation, would you join in as well? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come before you. I want to walk with you. I want to know the certainty of salvation. And I ask that you would help me. Jesus, I ask that you would come into my life. 
You've come to destroy the works of the evil one. And I ask that you would take away my sin and bring me into a living walk with you and with the Father. Holy Spirit, come. Bring me your life. Help me to sense your direction. Bring me into a closeness with you and with Jesus and the Father. Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for your forgiveness. I pray this through your name, Jesus. Amen.